Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a dynamic duo, Harp and Plow, is with me. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. For those who don't know, Kirsten was on the podcast, episode 104. Check that out. And I have Mark Copley with us as well. Can you say a little bit about your career and what you do since the the listeners here might not know about you? Sure. It's it's pretty crazy. Um, Hmm. You know, I started back... uh, out in really the mid nineties playing with blues bands. I was a guitar player in new England playing with different blues artists and stuff. And uh, at that time I started dabbling a little bit into producing different artists, mainly in the folk world or singer songwriter world, which is pretty prevalent in new England as well, especially Cambridge, Boston artists. So I started doing that and then uh, got in a really bad car wreck. And then in recovering from that, I ended up playing with a guy named James Montgomery, who was a kind of blues legend in the area, and ended up uh, producing his record, which was an amazing opportunity for me because James Cotton was on it from the Muddy Waters Band. And I ended up doing some touring with James Cotton as a result. And uh, it just took off from there with the songwriting thing and the blues thing. And the two kind of worked in tandem Mm -hmm. through getting signed to RCA as a solo artist. Uh, I put out that record in 2002 and uh, did okay. You know, and I was part of that uh, whole issue that we have constantly since then, which is the whole piracy thing, Mm -hmm. you know, back then it was Napster. And, um, you know, you can't make any money when people are taking your stuff. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a rough time. And I, I did some great touring behind the record though. I opened for Coldplay, uh, you know, a bunch of different artists through that time. And then, um, after that went back into producing a lot and playing guitar on film sessions, tons of albums and being like a New York really session musician and sometimes producer and engineer. And then, uh, man, let me see, I guess fast forward to now we're in Nashville and um, we've had six years here. And in the six years I've been fortunate enough to work on the TV show, Nashville, uh, play on a bunch of great albums, play guitar on a bunch of great albums and produce a ton of stuff. And I'm always writing songs with people. So that here is like the thing to do. I mean, it's like never a shortage of great songwriters. So that's pretty much it. And, and here we are with Harp and Plow. And, uh, you know, we, Kirsten and I had started this project 10 years ago. Mm-hmm in our little apartment in New York city yeah. and uh, like the corner of the room with a couple speakers and a couple of yeah. microphones. And, you know, we were really interested at that time in uh, one of my favorite eras of music, which is uh, depression era songs. Mm-hmm. So songs of really the thirties and forties to me were, it was such an interesting time and it was such a melodic time. I mean, you, you did have the beginnings of, you know, bluegrass and all that course blues and all that but you also had the tin pan alley writers and you know songwriters that were writing for broadway shows or things like that so we started getting into that then and then we both got extremely busy for 10 years got back (laughs) (laughs) yeah it got put aside and and uh here we are you know now we're finally Saying like, oh, this is a perfect time to do this because we're stuck in the house together looking at, a, you know, we built a really great studio here in, in the house because now we can actually have a house. It's not New York City. So yeah, yeah. we're here in Franklin, Tennessee. And, um, you know, we, we just have a, a beautiful kind of life going where we can go up there and turn on a couple of microphones and make stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> and And last time we recorded this, Kirsten was saying that, while we were doing the podcast, you were up there, you know, still working on the album or, or the debut single. Kirsten, why don't you say a little bit about the single and the song that you've chosen as the single? Sure. The first song that we that we decided to work on is uh, is an old Woody Guthrie song called mm-hmm. Pastures of Plenty. Um, he wrote it in 1941 and it, it's a classic of his. 
And um, we, it was one that we had worked on actually originally when we started this 10 years ago, as Mark just described. And it was, um, to us, it was an interesting one for our personal taste because we reimagined it and, and kind of changed the melody. Um, we, we deconstructed it in a way and, and made, it, uh, made it work with the harp doing this, this cool little riff throughout it. Um, and, and just rearranging it to be something that was more modern and, and more approachable for our current time. I've asked Kirsten this, but Mark, how, how does this work? Tell, tell me how this dynamic works as a, as, as a family and also, you know, working together musically. We talked a little bit about, uh, about this with Kirsten, but t tell us some, some awesome stories. I'm sure there's some. Yeah. She's, she's the boss and I work for her. <laughs> And that's how it works. <laughs> and there's no other way. <laughs> there's no other way. If there's a second opinion, we ask the dog. <laughs> he has the second opinion. And then I just listen to those two and make music. <laughs> oh, <come> on. <laughs> one so thing. Seriously, what... answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that is uh, unusual in some ways. Well, uh, Kirsten, you've taken the harp to so many places that probably most harp players have not taken the harp to and that we talked about that again on on, on your podcast and mark i have to have you on a, on a separate podcast because i'm sure you have so many amazing stories from working with so many legends and and for those who want to know more about your career your your solo career mark copley dot uh, com m-a-r-c-c-o-p-e-l-y.com check it out uh yeah you know he's worked with so many great artists and we'll we'll talk about that on on a separate podcast i i do want to have you on oh, that's um, great. Uh, a little bit about how you use the harp and i'm sure maybe you've worked with harp harp players before mark but how do you use the harp in this setting because prob it's probably haven't been done too much in, in the past or ev really ever <laughs> I, mean, I, don't really, I don't really think so i mean you know the harp as an instrument isn't something that those of us who grew up on American roots music, like I did, whether it be blues, jazz, or country music, or any, uh, you know, versions of those main genres, harp is never one of the instruments that you really deal with, except a little bit in jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear jazz harp as like Alice Coltrane or something, but um, I don't know, you know, it, it was funny when Kirsten and I, became a couple and we started spending a lot of time together and uh you know i started to hear the instrument all the time mm -hmm. i started to i don't know i guess i thought geez you know it just feels like it's a underutilized instrument mm -hmm. in modern music in a sense because it does have you know sort of a, a smaller range but a similar thing to like if you think of the piano that has been placed upright and instead of hitting a key you're, you're plucking it with your finger it becomes a lot more percussive even than a piano so you hear that percussive thing and I was always interested in world music so another uh, weird tangent I guess is that I've done a bunch of records with uh, Persian artists mm -hmm. and I love world music so I, I'm always listening to music from other countries and one of the my favorite things is like Tumani Diabate playing Kora. Mm. You know, I had a record with, with him and uh, God, I think it's Ali Fakatore or mm. something maybe. They did a, a duet record together and the Kora to me was, man, I just love the sound of it so much. It's so, it's so beautiful and it's so percussive and it sounds a little like a drum and a little like a, <laughs> you know, something like a, a harp. So, I don't know, I, I guess through listening to stuff like that and then hearing Kirsten play in the house and hearing concerts that, she, that she's playing, I thought, God, I, you know, maybe there's a way to incorporate this into roots music. Mm. So when I record her, uh, typically what I do, you know, Kirsten put out a, a, new, a new age album or a ambient album that you spoke about. I recorded that very classically. So it was really no transformers and no real coloration to the sound. And I did all the coloration after the fact or during her playing when I was manipulating sounds and stuff. So this album, what I 
am doing is using more coloration and microphones that have a lot more personality and things like that. So she really takes the place of like what a guitar could do or a mm. piano could do. Um, not that I'm thinking about it that way when we're producing the stuff, but I think it works really well because, uh, I mean, you know, we've all heard I'm a guitar player and it's a, the most commonly played yeah. <laughs> instrument in the world. So, you know, sometimes I'm like, God, another guitar thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What else can we do? And I guess it's just throwing, throwing that at traditional music, like a, just a different instrumentation. And I think it brings a lot of color out that um, we, you typically wouldn't get in an Americana yeah. album. Yeah. Kirsten, a little bit about, you know, I know it's, it's the duo, but a little bit about what, uh, are there other guest musicians that are involved? And are you, are you guys talking about what it should sound like, how it should be, or try this mic or try that? How, how are you involved in all of this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think when we're arranging the songs, it's definitely a collaborative thing. And, you know, even one of the most recent songs that, that we've been working on, I had recorded something very early on that we thought was going to work really well. As and, did I, yeah. And, yeah, we, we really, you know, we really thought, oh, that's it. We got the hard part. Excellent. We can keep moving forward. And then as, as, you know, things were being added to it, as the drums were being added and as, you know, the bass was added, then all of a sudden the harp's not fitting the same way that, that it should have. And it was getting, it was too noty and like it, it just had too much going on, right? So I had to re-record it <laughs> and, oh, wow, okay. and come up with a new part. But we, we have an open dialogue about that with every song that we're, that we're doing. And, um, the, you know, Pastures of Plenty obviously is a cover song and, and we released that as our first single, but the ones that we're going to be subsequently releasing um, are all original. Oh, wow, they're, okay. they're mostly not, I'm not a songwriter, but Mark obviously is. Yeah. And uh, he's collaborated with a lot of, of really wonderful people. Um, you know, one of the songs is from a previous album, a uh, solo album of his, um, and one he co-wrote with uh, a songwriter named Grantley Phillips, mm. who uh, is another Americana, you know, folk artist. Um, and th actually that song is really an exciting one for us because we have Roseanne Cash singing on oh. it and she will be featured on that song. Oh, wow. Okay. And I was going to ask, are, are there other guests that are going to appear on this album in the future? Yeah. I mean, well, we have, you know, the musicians on this, of course it's, you know, COVID mm -hmm. it's like the, our first COVID album. <laughs> so the whole COVID thing really threw us into this funny thing where it's like, well, typically I would have everybody in a room playing together for yeah. a few days and the record's done. I just go away and mix it and, and now we That's have to send the track to people and have them wow. play and send it back to us. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so. it's been a trip. It's been a trip. But the interesting thing about it is that casting, usually as a producer, you're really like a casting director, right? I mean, you're thinking, oh, hey, you know, the way this person plays bass and the way this person plays drums, this drummer comes from this sort of thing, you know, and you're, you're casting it and being very careful as to, who might inspire whom to do what when you're in there. And it's the same thing here, except that you have to make sure also that they have an ability to record themselves mm -hmm. and that they're good engineers and they can record it properly. Yeah. And luckily we have so many friends that are incredible. Like that one of the drummers on our album is a guy named Sean Pelton. Mm -hmm. And Sean has played on, so many hit records it's insane but he also is the drummer on saturday night live oh, okay and has been for 25 years you know? wow and uh has played on a lot of my favorite albums some sean colvin albums and roseanne cash and um and folks like that so with people like that another drummer friend of ours is ben whitman and ben has played with sting and he's played with uh paul simon tons of Persian records. He plays on all those records that I play on. And, um, and he's in Toronto. And, <laughs> you know, so on Pastures of Plenty, he's the drummer on that. Oh, wow. Really more of a percussionist because the directive that we gave him was, hey, we know you studied percussion in Ghana and we know you went to Brazil and studied when he, when he was younger. 
and he comes from a very world music, although he's American. Mm-hmm. Um, he's you know like playing I mean? goat hooves on the on the song, and yeah, he's and oh, like oh, all oh, these oh. like crazy African and Brazilian instruments. Yeah, he's really mixed it up. So that you know, we, that's what I'm talking about by guests on the album. You know, we we really casted it, or we're trying to cast it. You know in interesting ways I, I don't i didn't really ever hear this album as like a traditional americana hmm. record you know when we were already there's harp on it so we want to throw <laughs> caution <laughs> to the wind and have have some different instrumentation and some different production ideas that you wouldn't typically get although there's there have been examples of great you know, strides taken in, in as far as Americana album production, such as like one of my ones that I always think of is Emmy Lou Harris's Wrecking Ball. Mm. And that was a Daniel Lanois production. So you're talking about a guy who produces U2 and Peter Gabriel, mm. who was also doing that. And it, it, you know, so there have been these times where you, man, it really, it becomes so special when you, take risks like that. And I guess it's what we're trying to do with instrumentation and of course with the harp. Yeah. Well, I, I want to get both of your opinions on this. Uh, Mark, you said a little bit about Napster and early on about, you know, music being, you know, taken, you know, and uh, artists not being compensated for what they've contributed to the musical world. Well, in, in time of COVID, uh, you can't really tour now. Uh, and all, or you're relying on, using these platforms to make money and be able to, you know, put your record out there. How is all of this going to work and how, what's your plan? I mean, you put your single out there and you're going to have an album, but what's the plan? What are your thoughts about how to promote this album? Because there's no touring now. It's difficult. I mean, I think that's a tough, a tough question to even answer because we don't know what the future is going to look like and we don't really know how it's going to affect the music business long term. And so I don't know. I mean, our plan right now is to release music on a regular basis, meaning that we're probably going to have a single released every four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we're doing that on the obvious platforms on Mm -hmm. all of the obvious platforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so it's being just dis- distributed that way um, with the idea that, you know, at some point we will be releasing a, a full album, but we're, we're still trying to figure that out. We're talking to a lot of people about it, getting people's advice on it to, you know, to see what, what the best plan can be at this time. I don't know if you want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody really keeps referring to this time as the wild west yeah. in metaphorical sense. I guess that it's like, <laughs> what are we supposed to do? We, there's no plan. Nobody, I don't know of anybody who has a definitive plan or yeah. direction for any artist. So we're just going, taking it day by day and trying to make great music. And then we will do like Spotify. You know, Kirsten's really good with the Spotify stuff. And uh, I'm not. <laughs> I stay away from that. We wear the hats that we that we feel you know are the best for each of us. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. I stay away from all that stuff because I I think I do more harm than good. <laughs> on that. But yeah, you know, we we have a bunch of friends from just years in the business that are music managers and publicists and other musicians, other bands. Um, one one band that we're I'm virtual friends with, but Kirsten actually is physical friends with is the Mavericks. Mm, okay. And the Mavericks just put out a fantastic new record. It's mm. awesome. And and I'm all over the first, yeah, the first single. It. <laughs> <laughs> actually, not the first single. The first track on the album has Harp all over yeah. it, and that's me. <laughs> so, so you know, bands like that. It's it's a you know, they, they have this established long career and it's, it's going to be interesting to watch them traverse this terrain yeah. and to see what happens and how yeah. they do it. Yeah. I keep thinking about how we could do this for artists to benefit from the virtual, you know, release of albums and all these things, because it, it is such a tough thing and there's no, I mean, 
I, I just don't know how artists could have an easier time because so many places like Amazon and other um, uh, you know, businesses have been able to capitalize on some of these things where you sell a product, you still make a good profit or some kind of a profit where artists, they, they work so hard, you know, you spend hours and hours in the studio, both of you uh, recording these things, composing and, you know, putting this whole project together. And uh, then you don't get the return that you should and you deserve and way more than that. I just, I mean, uh, I know this is just a tough question, but uh, any, any thoughts? I mean, how else can artists work where they, they, they get some kind of a return on everything that they're contributing to the musical world? Any, any thoughts? <laughs> Man, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I really don't know. I guess it's, uh, man, partly being an artist for a living isn't necessarily even a choice. Yeah. It's like, I, I never felt like I had a choice. Mm. I, you know, I'm interested in a lot of other things, but I don't know if I'm passionate about a lot of other things. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's like the first thing I think of in the morning and I think about it all day and I'm talking to you right now. I think I have the studio ready to go right now because I have to sing a vocal on one of our songs today. So it's, you know, already thinking about that. I mean, this is just this is like, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess that's probably why musicians have been taken advantage of mm -hmm. so much in our lifetimes and our careers because we have to do this same with a painter or a dancer or, you know, everyone else that's being um, affected by this negatively. But on, I mean, on top of that, we all have to, I think, unfortunately, like I just said, wear a lot of different hats and start being your own social media director, your own marketing yeah. manager, yeah. your own, you know, advocate for playlists and podcasts and everything else. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's difficult. And, and, I don't think all of us are necessarily good at doing that. And you, and we have to figure out how to She's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he just chooses not to. I'm, and not, I'm not good at it. <laughs> he's like, he's like you, you can do that. You're good at it. I'm not, <laughs> but you know, but you figure out what, what you, you know, he's, he's engineering, he's mixing, he's writing songs, he's mastering, mastering some of it, you know, it's, it's some, not necessarily all of our stuff, but, but, definitely yeah. for other people. And, you know, it's, it's just, we, we do what we're good at and we try to just, just divvy it up in the way that, you know, that as a couple too, you know, that, that we can. So. Yeah. Well, for those who have never heard your music as a duo, uh, how would you describe it? Uh, and I know we already talked about it a little bit, but uh, obviously it's something that is breaking some boundaries and you're at, you have new perspective on this genre and just sort of a multi-genre. How, how would you describe it? Maybe some uh, famous artists where you could say it's a fusion of these couple of artists or, you know, just give people an idea about what your music is without them hearing your music. I know this is tough, but may, maybe you could answer it. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 I guess it would be fresh folk, like modern, modern Americana. I, I, I don't know what kind of titles to put on it. Yeah, it's, um, it's difficult. It's, it's kind of, you know, I always think of it as visual mm -hmm. and I write visually mm -hmm. some most, most of the time or a good portion of the time. Um, you know, one thing I always think of when I'm making a record is it has to have soul. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I won't ever pass up on is just, you know, the musicality and the soul thing have to, have a good marriage there mm -hmm. and that's what makes the, my favorite records my favorite records mm -hmm. so i mean as far as artists that maybe influenced us like we said emmy Lou harris is mm -hmm. a uh, amazing artist that we love and um and i mentioned daniel lanois who's one of my favorite guitar players a rock cooter of course for me guitar wise so and, and these are all artists that have pushed boundaries mm -hmm. and have tried different kinds of influences, maybe world music things or a different type of mix on an American sort of record or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's a mix of all of that, like early American folk meets our modern 
day where I'm playing like an electric guitar mm -hmm. with a delay on it and it has a little kind of ambient thing happening. So, you know, I, I guess that's about it. And as far as visual, as far as explaining our first song that people might want to go check out, which would be amazing for for them to go listen to for us. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just say that Thanks first. For Thank listening. you very much. <laughs> we worked our brains out on it. Um, you know, this, this is a song about the Dust Bowl era. So this this song was written about the era starting in 1930 to 1940, where American families were poor and this I, is the yeah, Great Depression. Migrant workers, yeah. Yeah, and they started to migrate toward the West. Mm to try to strike a, out for a better life for their families and for themselves. So we think it's really apropos as far as what's going on now where we all have to rethink our futures and our, our present and our own future. And um, really it's kind of an ode to the proletariat mm -hmm. in that sense that we all have to, like you were saying with music, how are we gonna make a living? I don't know. Yeah. I'm just gonna go out and start digging in the fields for good songs and <laughs> like hope yeah. people listen to it and hope people can, you know, hope it resonates. This. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it doesn't resonate that the great thing about some of these great artists and you and others who have come before you is that sometimes, you know, you put something out there, whether it's a classical composer, jazz, or we don't even have to have genres, but it, any, any musician, you put something out there, it might not resonate at the time, but maybe it comes back around 15 years later or something. People mm. are like, wow, that was actually something amazing and people didn't appreciate it. And this has happened so many times in music history where you know it didn't click the first couple of times, but it comes back later. So sometimes as artists, we have to think about not only you know just put good quality uh, projects out there and do, as you said, Mark, it, it has to have soul. It has to come from, you know, it's not just a technical thing, but it has to come from somewhere else as well. And, uh, and you put it out there and hopefully it resonates with people down the road as well. So any other things that you're currently doing that's not musical, because I, I, I feel like you're, you're so, so um, into this album and so many music projects. What else are you up to these days other than music? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I try to cook dinner every night because, you know, you can't really go out. So uh, he's a fabulous chef. You know, I'm not a fabulous <laughs> chef at all. I just he's uh, modest. I'm an, you know what I call myself? I'm an edible chef. <laughs> like <laughs> you can you can normally eat the food that I cook <laughs> and you won't get sick. And sometimes you'd be like, that was good. <laughs> you know, I mean, not, you know, I've had better, but it's good. Uh, <laughs> That's I'm an edible chef. Yeah, that's awesome. So I've cooking. never heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I just, can't, I just, that's just what came out of my mouth right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, something cool that I just did. Um, I've been part of this app called Insight Timer. And um, I actually have a guided meditation that I did on there that is featuring my music. So mm -hmm. I don't know. And I, and I did that's see that, yeah. Yeah, that's something new and interesting that I've been I've been diving into. So. A couple more questions. One, uh, Kirsten, uh, you've been really busy with social media and you're fantastic at it. Uh, for those musicians who, you know, don't have experience or just don't know how to do it, uh, any any things, any any tips, anything that you've learned through this process because you're you're very active and you know what you're doing. So, any tips to musicians who don't know what they're doing to to make it better for them to reach out to more people. Thank you. I don't know that I'm good at it, but I, but I definitely, um, I definitely try to stay active. I think, I think having a social media presence is really important as an artist. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's important to always have fresh content and to be showing what you're doing, but also keep it engaging for the, the people that are following you. Um, and, and that's tricky, you know, because I think you have to know, who your audience is and know who your followers are. And, mm -hmm. and you know, in my personal page, obviously I have a lot of harp followers, right? Mm -hmm. People that are interested in the harp or that are harpists themselves. So most of my page is geared towards the harp because mm -hmm. that's, you know, what I know my audience is. Um, for us, you know, we're, <laughs> we're just starting out. So it's, it's a little harder to, to 
get that that moving mm -hmm. um but but we're doing what we can to to you know post things that are relevant to folk music americana music our music us introducing ourselves as artists and showing who we are to people that might not know us otherwise and especially individually as well as as, as a band mm -hmm. you know yeah mark you said something at the very beginning of the show you said uh you you had an accident you came back and you continued playing and one thing that I, I like telling young musicians or artists in general is to have that mindset or just to have the approach of not giving up and, and, and just pushing forward. Uh, some, some of your experiences, what you had to deal, if, if you don't mind sharing uh, a, a little bit about what you experienced at that moment and how you, you know, dug deep to, to come out of that situation and continue music and do even more amazing projects than you've done before. Uh, a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the accident uh, occurred when I was, you know, 25, 26 years old. I had to recover for uh, almost a year from it. And uh, interestingly, at the time, my car was all packed up, ready to go, and I was moving to Nashville the next day. And a friend of mine had called and needed a guitar player for a gig, and his guitar player got sick, and I was picked up by the drummer in the band who's a friend of mine and we went out and played this gig and on the way home uh, got in a car wreck so you know I had like a car packed ready to go to Nashville I had already met because of being on tour and stuff I'd already met some of the A-list session players in Nashville and had told them I'm going to move and communicated with them and stuff and I uh, was really excited about that. So it wasn't even a career stopping thing in the sense that, you know, I broke my arm in a bunch of places and, and all kinds of stuff like that. So I couldn't play for uh, about six months. And um, yeah, so I guess all I can say about it is that during that time, similar to a time like this, where some stuff happens and you have no control of it and you have to improvise. You know, that's what we do as human beings. So it was similar to that in the sense that, all right, well, this is a terrible situation. I don't feel good and I'm bummed out because I can't play guitar, but I'm going to listen to some records. So uh, a bunch of friends of mine had I knew, I knew somebody who was a musical director at a radio station. She got me, a box filled with CDs of just whatever she could get. And she got tons of free CDs. So I was like, you know, I got this box of CDs. A, a few other friends of mine, they bought me books. And I was, uh, the guy I was in the accident with bought me this incredible book of Bob Dylan lyrics. Mm. So I really took the time to educate myself on even genres of music or some songwriters and artists that didn't know. Um, one of, this is a long time ago. One of the first things and, and one of the things that impacted me the greatest is Nick Drake. Mm. And I had never even heard Nick Drake. And this is way before Nick Drake became popular. And there was one of his songs on a Volkswagen commercial or something. And, uh, I really fell in love with his records to sound the production of the records as well as him as an artist. So really, I think you have to, to young people or any people who are trying, who want to pursue this and have to pursue this for a living. You, there are going to be tons of ups and downs and the downs are going to be really hard. I mean, getting dropped from RCA as an artist was heartbreaking for me. And you just have to learn from the experience and keep moving on. I mean, I remember hearing a story that Beatles got turned down 50 times yeah. by record companies or something. It's the Beatles. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, how the hell do you turn down the Beatles? But it happens. And, you know, that's part of the deal is as an artist, I mean, Van Gogh never sold a painting until he died. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, he could he barely could make a living. And uh, this is sometimes, like you said earlier, part of the deal when things come back around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're actually hoping that happens because we're one of the songs we're working on right now is for my first record. Mm -hmm. 
and it never got to see the light of day. It's a song called Truth and Oil, and it was my favorite song from the album. And it's my favorite song from his album, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, well, it's the one people, and people who know the record, which is now four people or five people. <laughs> More than that. <laughs> well, you know, have said, like, that's their favorite song on the album. And um, it just goes to show that, that, you know, things resonate and you have to just hang in there because here we are, what, 20 years later, almost 20 years later, and we're re-recording the song mm -hmm. and uh, taking another look at it. And I've never loved it more than I love it now. It's still, it's still there for me. So yeah, I mean, it was heartbreaking that nobody heard it the first time around. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll hear it the second time around. Yeah, and Kirsten, uh, one more question for you. Uh, you're teaching at the college and you're back to you know, working, uh, uh, yes. some of your experiences working virtually, I'm assuming, and- uh, Well, I was working virtually to end the semester, in okay. the spring semester, but we're actually back in person. At oh, Penn. wow, okay, okay. So, so, so they, how's, how's that going? Well, they have, a, they have a really good protocol in place. We're really fortunate because we're, we're right across the street from the Vanderbilt Medical Center, <laughs> which, is, you know, which is a really, a really wonderful <laughs> medical center in the United States, as, you know, as a matter of fact. But um, they have a good plan in place. And you know, we're required to wear masks uh, in class, the students and the faculty. Um, we're tested weekly. I mean, we have everything, you know, they have one way aisles, <laughs> directionals in the, in the building so that, so that we maintain social distancing. Um, and the, the, my studio has been measured out so that I know exactly where the six foot distance is. And it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's a layer on top of the, the, you know, traditional stressors of, of, you know, teaching, but it's it's going okay and and they they have a plan in place which is which is great wow okay well that's amazing any other any other thoughts about the single anything else you want to add before we end we would just love that your that you, the listeners go and check out our single and maybe give us a follow on our socials and and follow us on our journey thank you that was great thank you so much thank you have a beautiful day you too yes. it's great to see you Tikran. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.